Welcome to the Embracing You podcast with your host, Eric Pothen. We are all on our own unique journey to discovering ourselves. Each episode, I will help you navigate the journey within to reconnect with and discover the innate love you have for yourself. This podcast will cover topics from self-love to eating disorders and body image to mental health and to overall well-being. My goal is to help you honor and embrace yourself so you may live your most authentic life. Let's dive in. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Embracing You podcast. I hope that you all have been doing well um, and staying warm. I am just recording this intro on a very snowy Tuesday here in Minnesota um, towards the end of March, and we had just had a nice stretch of warm weather, and in true Minnesota fashion, we got this next round of snow. Um, And so I'm very excited to be back here with you all today. Um, And today we are going to be having a conversation with Eileen Rose Miles. And we are going to be talking about body-mind connection and eating disorder recovery. So here is a little bit about Eileen. Eileen Rose Miles is a meditation guide and 500 yoga instructor who shares her transformative practices through leading meditations on Insight Timer, on her podcast, The Inward Journey, in conducting virtual meditation teacher trainings. She leads retreats and workshops as well as one-on-one virtual meditation sessions. With her husband by her side, she embarks on a nomadic journey in her camper van, growing her passion to create more meditators and meditation guides while embracing the beauty of travel and adventure. And you all, to start out today's conversation with Eileen, she actually is going to be guiding you and all of us in a beautiful meditation practice that will be able to be used by you should you find yourself feeling triggered or some uncomfortable emotions around mealtimes. So without further ado, let's dive in. Okay. So go ahead and turn inward, whatever that means to you. You can close your eyes or keep them open. Allow your hands to rest gently on your lap if that feels okay. Maybe palms down for a sense of grounded energy. And just simply start to notice your breath without any desire to fix or change it. Just notice your breath. And when you're ready, take a slow inhale through your nose. Big exhale out your mouth. Breathe in, exhale, let it go. One more slow, deep breath in, exhale, let it go. Slowing down the breath. Allowing your focus to shift to your breath. Inhaling deeply. Exhale, letting go. Allowing your entire face to relax. Feel your shoulders soften down. And feel your awareness move from your overthinking, overanalyzing mind and into your heart. Encouraging the breath to deepen as you drop into your heart space. Breathe in. Breathe out. 
without any judgment, noticing the energy around your heart. And as you drop out of the mind and into the heart, what truth is present here? What is it that your heart can remind you right here? Breathe in slowly. Let it go. Within the heart, there is no doubt. You are more than a body. You have permission to enjoy all foods. You are worthy and loved just as you are. If your heart could speak to you, what would it say? What would it remind you? If it feels safe to you, placing your hands over your heart. Breathing in deeply. Exhale. Feeling this reunion with with your heart. Becoming a little more heart-minded. Remembering that you don't have to Love your body fully. And you can choose to respect it. In this moment, can you whisper, thank you, body. Thank you, body, for holding me through life. Thank you, body. Softening here a little bit more. Breath in. Let it go. Take a moment to feel maybe a subtle shift within you. And be proud of yourself for choosing to turn inward and remember You are on the same team with you. From my heart to yours. Blinking your eyes open slowly if they were closed. Gently coming out of your practice. Thank you so much for leading us through that meditation. I feel so zen. I've had a couple of pretty busy weeks the last couple of weeks, and it feels good to intentionally turn in and to honor myself and my body. So thank you so much for leading us through that meditation. You're welcome. Yeah, it felt good to me too, honestly. When I lead meditations, I'm also, when I come out of it, I'm like, whoa, okay, (laughs) there you are. Yeah, it's like coming back to reality in a way of like, wow, when you turn within and you have that intentional time with self and then to re-enter into reality, there's there's quite a difference. Well, thank you again. Um, so to start, or I should really say to continue our conversation, um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do for work, and what led you to share your story with us today. Yeah, well, I'm currently sitting in my van, which is my home on wheels. It's a little mini camper van, and my husband and I built it together, which is really fun and special. And oh goodness, I currently am a full-time meditation guide which is really incredible to say this is what I get to do every single day is lead meditation, record meditation. um, And then I'm now 
on my third round for my meditation teacher training. So I'm helping to create more meditation guides. Um, and the reason why I'm so grateful to share this practice is because it truly did save me. And I was introduced to meditation um, when I was introduced to yoga when I was 12 years old, which is about almost a de- over a decade. I said almost a decade, like I was 20 years old, but I'm almost 30. <laughs> there, I can't, I can't do math. But um, oh my goodness, what is it? Fifth. It's almost 18 years ago then. Yeah. Um, Which is wild to think. Um, And then yoga led me to meditation. And, you know, there's so many things. I don't I don't even know where to start, really. Yeah. Thanks so much for that introduction. And, you know, I am thinking back to when we first connected and that was through Instagram and you had reached out and had just made a comment of thanking me for the work that I was doing. And then we started to talk a little bit just about, you know, our own lived experiences with an eating disorder and disordered eating. Um, And so if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about your story with us, whatever you're comfortable sharing, um, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. So when I was 12 years old, you know, going through puberty and everything, I started to see a shift in my body. And I mean, I think growing up, too, there was a lot of language around body that wasn't very positive, too. Um, And that led to when I was 12 years old, I vividly still remember, you know, going up to my mom and saying, I don't feel good in my dance costumes anymore. And saying to her, you know, I, I feel like that girl looks better in it, you know, or my, why, my stomach is, you know, not looking great. And already like having that perception of myself at that young age. And so it breaks my heart because I decided to quit dance. And I wish I hadn't. But at that time, I thought it was the only way out of the discomfort that I was feeling in my body was to just avoid that um, experience as as a whole. And so I, you know, thankfully, though, I was able to um, go to our local gym that had yoga classes, and that's where I discovered yoga, thanks to my mom for taking me there. And in the back of my mind, even though I was starting to learn, like, okay, there's this practice of turning inward, of moving your body, kind of like a dance in a way, right? And going into all these different shapes and poses and connecting to your breath, that was so beautiful to learn. But in the back of my mind, I still was like, something's wrong with my body. I have to fix it. And so I took a bunch of group exercise classes at a young age. And then that led to, oh, mom, what's this Whole30 book that you have? (laughs) And doing that diet. And then, you know, once I was in middle school, high school, I, I, I was getting into my fitness pal and tracking everything. And it got to a point where I crossed the line and it just was not, it was not the right way to live. I was so hyper focused on food and movement. It's all I did. And I stopped, you know, I said, hey, I can't hang out tonight. I'm busy. I'm going to the gym for three hours, things like that. Um, So I started noticing all of those disordered type of behaviors and then just not feeling joy around food at all. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your story, well, first of all, thank you for sharing. And as I've been listening to other stories of guests on my podcast, there, I feel like there are so many common threads. And what I'm hearing in your story is the onset of it. And when you were, you know, at, at such a young age involved in dance and how you had first had those thoughts about your body at such a young age, which, you know, I feel like there is there are so many things that contribute to the onset of disordered eating or an eating disorder. And it really, you know, it's all of these things that just stack up like building blocks on top of one another. And so 
like that was the foundational block for you was that first moment of those thoughts of what your body looked like in as you were comparing your body to the other individuals in your dance class and then we start adding on these other layers of you saw your mom's whole 30 diet book and was like oh i want to do this so then there's that level and then you ha- add the yoga and then that led to the uh, over exercising. And so one thing that just remains so true is that the onset of eating disorders is so multifaceted for every individual. Um, and so I just want to thank you for your courage and in sharing that part of your story with us here. And I'm, I'm go- I want to add on to that and have conversation a little bit more because Today's conversation really is about body and mind connection. And as it relates to struggling with food or eating disorders or disordered eating, um, body image, et cetera. So a question I have for you is if you were to think back to when you were really struggling with your eating disorder, what was your mind and body connection like during that time? That is a great question. And to go back to what you just said too, it's like, I did just share one block. It's like, I could go on and on and talk about how everything evolved for me for sure. Um, But to answer your question, I think immediately it's like, there's a disconnect. There was a huge disconnect for sure. Kind of like I said, in our meditation, it was, I was not on the same team with my body at all. And there was this huge disconnect. And yet at the same time, it's all I could focus on. So I thought I was connected to it, right? Or I thought I was like, oh, I know what's best for it. I'm just trying to be healthy. You know, when my friends or my family members were like, oh, wow, you're at the gym for this long. Or, oh, wow, you're not choosing to have dessert. And, oh, wow, you're so healthy. Um, I'm putting air quotes around healthy, though, right? Like there's... There's a, there's a true definition to health um, and being healthy that I now know. <laughs> um, but at that time, yeah, I was totally, I would say disconnected. It, it, was, it was me at war with myself most of the time. And it's all I could think about. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm hearing two things. One is if you were able to zoom out and be in the body that you are now and connected to the individual living in the body. Now that's when you were describing that, that's the part of you where I'm hearing, oh, there was a disconnect, right? And then there's this other part of you, the individual that was living in the body that was struggling with, with, with the way your body looked and with exercise and with food, where you felt there was a connection. And so I just kind of want to reflect that paradigm back to you a little bit where we have this today version of yourself noticing clearly there's a disconnect that was going on between both body and mind then versus you when you were struggling, there is a connection. And where my brain goes with that is when you are in the depths of struggling that disordered eating or eating disorder voice tries to convince you that that connection between body and mind is there. Because once you are listening to the mind and what it's telling you to do with regards to what you might need to do to change the appearance of your body, you get that reinforcement, right? You see potentially physical change. You get the mental reinforcement. And so that eating disorder, disordered eating voice looks for these things in order to convince it to you that you actually do have that strong body and mind connection. I have chills. Yeah. It's, that's what's so hard about it. Right. And that's what's so, I mean, that's just what kept me in it. I feel like for years and years, right. Is thinking that, oh no, this is me doing my best, being my best. And another layer to it too is in that or during that time of my life, that was the only way for me to cope and feel something other than the sadness and pain that I was experiencing with my family and my siblings who were struggling with mental health issues. And so that was my one thing to kind of 
to cope and have control. So there's that, of course, that comes into it. And so to me, it was like, I'm taking care of myself. I'm not, I don't have any anxiety or depression. I'm, I'm good, you know? <laughs> um, so it is so hard and interesting that that's what the mind does and how disordered eating and eating disorders work to convince you of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious to just dig a little deeper into this concept. And if if you were to try and put yourself back into that body and in and, and that point in time, describe what your relationship was like with your mind at that point. I I mean, my relationship with my mind was a not so good relationship. <laughs> it was, you know, all I could hear was the voice of my inner critic. All that was going on in my mind was negative self-talk. All that was happening in my mind was just, you need to do this. You should work out. You need to eat this, not that. You, you know, that's, it was totally full of all those disordered thoughts. Um, Yeah. Thinking back on it, it's wild because now today it's so different, completely different, which is amazing. And also why I am so grateful to be here with you talking because that's all I want for everyone is to feel that freedom and that, that joy around food and having a better relationship with your mind and body for sure. So, um, but yeah, it was not, I mean, if people could hear what went on in my mind during that time, uh, be really, really hard to hear for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of an exercise my own therapist has had me do in the past where, you know, whenever I'm kind of noticing more tumultuous or that inner critic coming out, to write those thoughts down on a piece of paper and to say them out loud. There's something about the physical act of speaking things out loud that really can create a shift, I think, in the way we think about the way we speak to ourselves. And so, you know, I offer that up for listeners where, you know, if you find yourself in that self-deprecating or in that bad body talk space, pause, write those down, read them out loud. If you would not read that to a close friend of yours or anyone in your family, why should you be speaking them to yourself? Totally. That's a really powerful exercise because I think, yeah, especially saying out loud, it's like, you're going to be able to say, whoa, like, am I hearing myself say that, you know, or yeah, that's a good one for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess we kind of just jumped into this conversation talking about body and mind connection. And as two people familiar with this concept of body-mind connection, would you be willing to explain what this concept is for someone that might not be familiar with what we're talking about? Mm, That's a great question. Yeah, I think I would say having this body-mind connection is the word that comes to mind is listening. I think it's a lot of us live up in our headspace and we never drop into our body and listen to our body and feel that connection, that reunion with our body and mind. So I think it's really just being in tune and listening to your body and then having your mind be a more compassionate, accepting, loving space as well. Mm. Yeah, I love that you use the word listening, right? I think so many of us are taught to not listen and to tune out. I think a lot of what the body communicates to us on a daily basis. So I love that you use that word listening because I think it's such a key and integral skill when we talk about body and mind connection, right? Because if you don't aren't able to listen and you aren't able to even be aware that your body is talking to you, how, how can you even begin to heal that connection between the two? Totally. I mean, thinking back to 
when I was really struggling, I was listening to everyone but myself. (laughs) It was total external focus and listening to what that person was doing, that person's workout, what they were eating, right? All of that versus what does Eileen want and need in this moment? And so, yeah, I think that listening is so key and tapping back into your intuition, of course, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another guest that I had had recently on my podcast it said what I'm about to say, but it really stuck with me. And I think it really aligns with what you had just talked about here when we're talking about body and mind connection and that a lot of the healing happens from the neck down. It doesn't happen from the neck up, right? Because when we're thinking neck down, we're thinking heart, we're thinking heart space. And if that connection is severed at the neck, you're not able to get into the place that really needs that love and attention. And so I just want to reflect that back as well of, you know, what that former guest had said aligns directly with what you were saying there too. That's a beautiful connection. I mean, that's true. And that's, that's why too, I said in the meditation as well, it's like drop out of the overthinking, overanalyzing mind and into your body, which is really hard and scary to do. It really is. It's easier kind of right to, or we think it's easier to just stay in the mind and stay in that space, but there's magic when you connect back to your heart and body for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to jump back to your story just a little bit and, and hear the next chunk of it because we've kind of talked about the onset and the initial part of your story, but I'm curious to know what the next part was, what your relationship to body and mind was, and then maybe if you could just begin to talk about you entering out of that space and into a space of recovery and what that was like for you. Yeah. So there's so many things, you know, I, I feel like what really comes to mind and heart is that there was just so much energy spent. I don't want to say wasted because it's part of my story and I am who I am because of it too. Right. But just so much energy was spent thinking about my workout, thinking about the next meal. I was so anxious to go out to dinner with friends. Um, There was a lot of events, you know, I, I have so many vivid memories of going on a really fun camping trip with my friends and I brought all my own meals for that weekend because I was convinced I could not enjoy typical campground around the fire meals, right? And I also, another memory, you know, is just going up north. Up north is northern Michigan. We say up north in Michigan. Um, And I remember going up there and just thinking, oh, I can't have a bun with my burger, things like that. And just really feeling that overwhelm every time I went out to eat. And just yeah, missing out on life with the people I love. You know, I think it's Christy Harrison or Chrissy Harrison, who I don't know if you're familiar with. Is it Chrissy Harrison? It's Christy Harrison. Yep. Christy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. She deserves, her name deserves to be said because her book, Anti, Anti-Diet, Anti really helped me as well. Love, love, love. And she talks about eating disorders being a life thief, I believe is how she says it. And that's it. It steals, it's a thief of your life and takes you away from the present moment, which is now the work that I do right now, right? So I just, so many memories of just, you know, the anxiety or the shame after eating a certain food or meal, just feeling that guilt and that urgency to need to go work out. And to overexercise. And yeah, another thing too, Eric, is my social media feed on Instagram was filled with the what do I eat in the day? What do I do for my workouts? Here's this diet, all of that. And so I really had to take a 
long, loving look at that and realize it's not serving me and unfollow a ton of people. Um, But yeah, just everywhere I looked, it was all about that. It totally took up my entire life. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with diet culture. It's, It's everywhere. It surrounds us. It tries to disguise itself when, you know, it really is diet culture in and of itself. Um, you know, even simple things as like fat-free tortilla chips or low sodium, whatever, like that's diet culture. Diet culture is everywhere. It's unavoidable. It, it has really grabbed onto a lot of people in today's society. And it's frustrating to hear that, you know, in hearing your story, that diet culture played a large role when you were struggling because you were were being reinforced almost in a way by diet culture and it convincing you to make these decisions for your body that maybe didn't serve it in the best way. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, just for another example, it's the calories on a menu when that I think that came out when I was in the depths of my disordered eating and everything. And a part of me was like, oh, cool. (laughs) This is good, right? Now I look at that and I'm like, why do they have these on here? I just want to pick what I enjoy. And I do now, thankfully. But it's like, why? All I need to know is the ingredients. Thank you. Because if I have an allergy, which I don't, thankfully, but that's the only reason why you shouldn't eat a food is if there's an allergy or you truly don't like it, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah, calories is not going to determine now whether or not I enjoy something. But yeah, and that was diet culture. That's diet culture, I feel like, to me, for sure. Um, Yeah. So now that we've kind of talked about, you know, when you were in the depths and and kind of your way out, what were the first steps that you took to begin to heal this relationship with your body and mind? I have a really, really special person in my life. Her name's Bella Largen. She is a dietitian and she slowly, gently started to just question some of my behaviors. Like when I, you know, was cutting out whole food groups and things like that, she was like, why is that? Or I don't even remember exactly what she asked me, but she slowly was helping me challenge my disordered eating thoughts. So that really helped. Um, And I think slowly over time, too, we would have more conversations around the people that we follow on social media. Um and help me realize, okay, if I look at someone's profile or what they post and I just, it either reinforces a not so great thought or makes me feel not so good about myself, I I just unfollow right away, immediate unfollow, right? Um, and then we did actually, she, she led a intuitive eating workshop with one of her colleagues, Mary, and we read anti-diet and she taught me the 10 principles of intuitive eating. And so because of that, um, that is what really slowly started helping me challenge my own thoughts, my own choices, and yeah, heal my relationship with my mind and body. Um, And then it all did kind of have to come down to me and choosing to see a therapist as well. And uh, it's so hard, but it really is the the ability to have the awareness, which is where meditation really came into play too, is once I really started diving into yoga in a different way and meditating, I was able to realize, hmm, these thoughts are not serving me and I do not have to believe everything I think. And so it helped me really become aware of the thoughts and especially when it was really hard to choose to not work out and rest instead because I didn't have to work out if I didn't want to, (laughs) right? And then once I was challenging myself to eat foods that I was once very fearful of, I was able to use my meditation practice and yoga to regulate my nervous system in those moments too. Mm, That's beautiful. And 
you know, I want to offer up to listeners again that this meditation that you led us through at the beginning of today's episode is going to be clipped and also uploaded to my podcast stream so it's easily accessible for people to use and integrate should they feel like they are struggling at a meal or are really in the depths of some um, you know, negative self-talk around body. And so I just want to thank you so much for sharing your gift of being a medica- uh, medication, a meditation coach. Um, and thank you for sharing those gifts of you being that um, with the, us and the audience that we have with us today. Yeah. And that's the thing. It, it takes, it takes a lot of practice too. And of course, you know, especially with some of the affirmations I said at the end of, you know, you are more than a body. You are loved and worthy just as you are. Those, they're affirmations, right? I like to think of them more of as practice thoughts though, because in the moment we might not feel that at all. But if we practice and practice and we strive to fill our mind with that thought and reframe our negative thoughts to that, it can really help for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm even thinking to not, o- not only with this example you just gave of affirmations, but even what you had just described when you had met with this woman who was a- an integral part of your healing journey was that you know, when we enter into the space of meditation and when we enter into, you know, our own healing journey and we begin to uncover some of these disordered thoughts from a different perspective, it it really requires us to zoom out a little bit, right? Where it, it requires us to detach in a way, not in an unhealthy way, but it it, it, it makes you look at it from a different perspective. And I don't think unless a mirror is held up to us very much. So it sounded like that was your experience with having those initial questions being asked you of, well, why are you cutting those certain foods out? Right. And having that mirror be held up to you, that shift in thoughts, it's going to be really hard for that to happen. Totally. You need you need someone like a Bella and also my husband too right now. Chad is amazing at helping me with, you know, ongoing recovery too, where we go to a restaurant or since van life is wild and we're definitely enjoying all foods. Thankfully, that's where I am and will always be now. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, we, we go to different restaurants or stop at different places and he's like, well, oh, what are you going to get, honey? And I'm like, I think I'm going to get the salad. He's like, is that really what you would like in this moment? And I was like, hmm, maybe not. I think the sliders do look really good, you know? <laughs> um, so he's helping me like really tap into like, ooh, what would bring joy and pleasure? Because that voice still sneaks in is like, should you have that? Um, so con- that ongoing gentle curiosity really is what it is that can help you. Yeah, zoom out. I love that. And really see yourself. Because now when we go to make those decisions, I think with food and movement, it's really about intention and joy for me, I think. Is this going to bring me joy and satisfaction or is this a should? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I really love that you're pointing out, you know, how your own inner narrative and dialogue has shifted. and. I mean, I hear a lot of my own internal dialogue as well when I still find myself in moments of struggling and what you had just talked about. And I think, you know, this is when it comes to, you know, do you have that connection between body and mind, right? Where are you able to listen enough to what your body is communicating to you to allow your mind to re and to reinforce what your body is telling you? And so I just think, you did such a beautiful job of kind of giving listeners an insight on what that inner narrative looks like and what it means to have body and mind connection, especially if you find yourself struggling with food and or eating. And it comes directly back to this whole concept of intuitive eating and intuitive movement. 
so much of that is your ability to be connected to both your mind and body. If you aren't connected, how are you going to know what you intuitively need to do? Intuitive requires awareness, right? And trust. But if you if you aren't aware and you don't have a connection, take that word off the plate, pun intended, right? But like um, intuitive eating and intuitive movement, just it, it requires that trust and connection. Totally. Yeah. One of my favorite questions now is, what do I need or want in this moment? And just really dropping in. And the first thing that comes to mind, yep, I'm going to trust it. Trust is huge too. And And for so long, I trusted everyone outside of me, meaning the people that I was following and thinking that I needed to look like them or eat like them, right? And so, yeah, a lot of it is coming back to that inner voice and that deep knowing and trusting what comes forward when you ask, what do I feel like enjoying eating right now? Or my favorite thing too with movement because now I follow a bunch of amazing people that only continue to help me grow and heal like yourself. Um, There was someone, oh goodness, I forget her IG handle, but she uh, just talked about, yeah, how can you take a moment before you move your body to, on a scale of one to five, what is your excitement for movement? And I'm just going to stop there. That's actually all I'm going to share because that to me is the number one indicator for me of am I just forcing myself to move or am I actually like, or am I actually, I'm excited to listen to music and do whatever feels good for me on that day. Um, yeah, just so many, there's, there's tools out there externally that can help you practice internally. Okay, what, what do I need? in this moment, what would actually serve me and feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier that, you know, really being able to connect body and mind is a practice. And I believe it's an ongoing practice and we can always be strengthening the connection between body and mind, whether it be through meditation or other mindfulness activities Um, seeing a therapist, you know, a lot of these things, trusting our intuition. And I know that for me, I still struggle with that from time to time. And when I meditate, it's, it's, it's quite normal for my mind to wander off and for it to not be fully present with the breath and with my body. So I guess what tips or tricks or what are some things that individuals can do should they be struggling with creating this connection between body and mind? The mind is allowed to wander. We are human. And that is something that's one of my favorite myths to debunk for people. Because I think a lot of us, we resist meditation because we don't think we're good at it. Because we think that it just needs to be complete silence in the mind. Right? And it's supposed to be easy and it's really not easy and it can it can be uncomfy for sure and there can be a lot of resistance the mind is allowed to wander it's normal for us to stray away from the present moment the practice is in coming back again and again and again coming back to your breath and practicing compassion as you do that right we don't want to be like come on eileen why are you being so silly today? Like come back to the present moment or, you know, saying negative things and practicing frustration. We want to say, come back to this moment. One breath. And just really, that's what I tell people is just whisper to yourself, come back in the most compassionate way. And the breath is the anchor to the present moment. So breathing, hearing your breath. That's why I like to cue and exhale out the mouth because that allows you to really drop into the moment too. Um, And one of my favorite kind of quotes is, you cannot breathe in the past. You cannot breathe in the future. All you can do is breathe right here, right now. And that really helps as well. Um, And then, of course, having a guide. (laughs) That's what I get to do, right? Having someone guide you gently is really, really helpful. 
Um, so that's like another way to kind of have a focal point is focusing on the guide as well as your breath. Um, and then just normalizing the thoughts that come and go and letting it be versus trying to think it's supposed to, supposed to be a certain way. Um, it's a practice, not perfection. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you, what you had just said right there accurately reflects recovery as a whole, where the mind will wander, meaning these disordered eating thoughts are going to come and go, right? But as long as we can remind ourselves, come back here right now, because who we are now in the moment is an evolved and changed person with a different mindset than the person who lived previously earlier on in your body. And so I just love that that right there is such a beautiful reflection of what recovery is too, and being able to come back here to the present moment. And also with breath, right? You cannot breathe in the past, meaning you can't live back in that body of your eating disorder. You can't change the future, right? You can't change your body's future if you're in the here and now. But rather, f being with yourself in the here and now is going to bring you the most amount of peace and internal comfort and get you out of thinking in the past and in the future. Because all you have, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, is right now. Yeah. No, I love it, though, Eric. That was so beautifully said. It's so true. And all that matters is the you that's here now. And so how can you respect and accept the you that's here right now too, and just be here for this version of you. I think really what it comes back to as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we end our time here together, um, I'm curious if you were to give any words of advice um, to any individuals out there who may be struggling with an eating disorder or disordered eating or body image, what would you say to them? <laughs> it makes me want to tear up. Wow. I would say... You are so worthy of receiving support, and there is so many people actually that are going through something very similar to you, if not the exact same thing as you, and so you are not alone in that, and I hope that brings you comfort, and there are so many people out there to support you and guide you through your healing journey. And there's freedom on the other side of it, which you are worthy of feeling. And yeah, I just, I just want you to know that you're not alone and that there's other ways to deal with the pain that you might feel. And something else that's really important is, yes, it might feel like all that is within your mind is an inner critic, but there's actually an inner friend waiting to be discovered by you. And it's possible for you to feel on the same team with you. Mm, I love that so much. I love that idea of there's an inner friend waiting for you, which I think is so true when we are in recovery. And, you know, I think recovery is the road back to ourselves. And so I love that idea of having an inner friend that's just sitting there and waiting for us to return and to feel united with self again. And so thank you so much for those words. They were very, very beautifully said. Um, so a couple more questions before we end our time, but the title of this podcast is Embracing You. So how does the work that you do and your own journey of living with an eating disorder and being in recovery allow yourself and others to embrace themselves? I love the title of your podcast, by the way, because I think embracing you is like, I mean, I just picture myself when I was in my eating disorder days, reaching outward and being like, help me feel worthy? What can I do to feel better? And then it's like, no, take your hands and place them around your body. Give yourself a hug. Embrace you as you are. And remember, the you that you are right now is enough. And 
embracing, I feel like also is accepting. And with meditation, it's, that's really it, is just accepting how you feel, the thoughts that are swirling in your mind, and witnessing yourself with non-judgment and just embracing, accepting all that's within you. And yeah, that is what I guide people towards, is just witnessing the mind and becoming a loving witness um, and creating this loving awareness because there's actually nothing you need to change or fix about you, which is really hard to do. So yeah, yeah, that would be my answer. (laughs) Awesome. And then lastly, if people are interested in learning more about you, um, where can we find you? I'm on Instagram at Eileen Rose Miles. And then I also am a meditation guide on Insight Timer, which is a free meditation app. So you can find me there uh, as Eileen Rose. Wonderful. Well, I will be sure to include those uh, handles in the show notes for listeners so they can easily find you um, on Instagram or on Insight Timer, which is an incredible app that I use personally. So I'm a huge fan and I will have to look up some of your meditations on there after our time here together. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Eric. It was a joy to talk with you and I appreciate everything that you're doing in this world too. Oh, thank you. And it was such an honor and thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom with us and your story because it's not easy to be vulnerable and share these darker parts of our story. And so I just want to Thank you from the bottom of my heart for stepping into a very vulnerable space today um, and to share your story with us. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. So thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Again, it was an honor. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank my dear friend Eileen for being a guest on the Embracing You podcast today. Another quick reminder here before we end our time here together that the meditation that Eileen led us through at the beginning of today's episode is also going to be uploaded as a separate track to the Embracing You podcast. So be on the lookout for that, and that will be readily accessible for you should you feel like you need a meditation to help ground you in a moment of distress around food, eating, and or body image. So... Once again, until next time, I hope that you all continue to take care of yourselves, to begin to turn inwards and listen to what your heart is communicating to you on a daily basis. And most importantly, you continue to trust that inner tuition that you all have and continue to treat yourselves with love and respect. Much love. <laughs>